pleasure to be with you ladies on online virtually i've never thought about about it about letting people into your living room kind of thing i've never actually thought about it like that i've been more paranoid about what my living room looks like to others <laughs> and, room call and which positions to take it's, it's those things about being in parliament really um how it comes across so it's that and some people have wonderful backgrounds i've still not mastered how to get a really really nice sunny background uh, on but anyway it is an absolute pleasure to be here and i'm really really looking forward to be um que questioned and asked but in the time that i've got i was going to structure it something like this because we've got some extra time uh, first three, three four minutes is literally where my background is and it will be a real run through and there'll be lots that i do miss out because um i am writing a book and that i started that a few years ago and i still haven't finished it so i've got so much to pack in uh, if, I, if it wasn't me that lived my life i'd probably not believe i'd live that life it's been an interesting roller coaster to get to parliament so i'll talk about that and then i'll talk about my um elections i had two elections uh well three elections now one of them was a normal election two of them weren't so i'll talk a bit about them and then i'll also talk to you about what it is like i'll finish off by talking about what it is what i feel it's like as me as a muslim woman as a politically black woman the issues how um, blm the issues that were more recent about um you know talking about where for, for me there's this there's this conversation to be had about as a, as a muslim woman what role do i play in the politically uh, the issue of uh, blm as a politician and being mindful of my own uh, constructs of who i am and but equally supporting those uh, in different fights and that intersectionality because i think that's really really missed in parliament uh, which was really evidenced by uh, the response that i had when i wrote to uh, priti patel uh, last month so um so in terms of where, where i've come from I, i've come from a very very unusual background insofar as my campaigning started um i i think my inequality started the minute i was conceived and that's how i opened my book which is you know my my uh, inequality was embryonic in terms of because i was a girl because i was um and despite my father being biologically responsible for my gender it was my mother that got blamed for having a girl and not giving her the pri him the prized boy so for me there's this thing about the concept of shame and honor it starts right in the womb and it starts beyond, before you're even born so you're just you're, you're brought into a world which is an equal uh, because of the, the where you come from um so i think you know you just carry it on for generations you inherit that from your your parents you inherit some of that and then you come into a world which is a, a further unequal because you're you've already got the inequality of being a woman and then you've got the inequality, inequality of the cultural issues that you're born into and then you've got the world the world that you're born into which has its own inequalities and it has different layers of inequality and um, so as, as, a, as a young girl uh, growing up growing up in Bradford I was sent to Pakistan at the age of 12 um, I was in a forced marriage at 15 I didn't recognize that forced marriage that it was actually forced until I was in my 30s and um, because it was the done thing so I, I needed to unpick a lot of that I didn't recognize that in that marriage that um, it, being in that marriage by default may you know I, 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 I know and I talked about I didn't talk about my own physical rape what i understood rape to be but i and i and i and i knew that had happened to me but i didn't really grasp the idea that actually my whole marriage was full of that because it was forced in the first instance and i didn't get that until i came into politics because people started talking about my forced marriage thanks to uh, george galloway pulling out my uh, marriage certificate at my first husband so we had um so, so i had an interest so, so so I had a journey of my own. Coupled with that was the fact that my mum killed an abusive partner when I was just 18 and my brother and sister were 11 and 13 and she went to prison. And when she went to prison, that was a whole different conversation. So I had my own parallel stuff of forced marriage. I, I had my dad uh, leaving my mum for the neighbor's daughter, lots of domestic violence, which I'd witnessed there um, with my mum being beaten up, et cetera. And then my mum killing a guy who abused her and who had designs on her daughters and then she went to prison and then that's where my 
real, I think my political activist journey started. So I started with South All Black Sisters. You know, my mum's experiences at the time were very much never coming across a, you know, never coming across a woman, being arrested by men, being dealt by men, being, you know, solicitors were men. Everybody she experienced was white men, generally speaking. And I often say, had my mother been arrested by a female officer, had my mother been had a Asian lawyer or a, or a lawyer who got her cultural context, had she been dealt by with a judge who was of uh, black heritage or ethnic heritage or understood the concept of is it shaman and everything else, then maybe her outcome would have been different rather than serving 14 years in prison. Because it wasn't just her that served the sentence, it was us as children that served the sentence, experiencing homelessness, etc. So that's where my political kind of journey started about inequalities. Um, one of my first awards that I won was back in 1998. And funnily enough, last night I was going through, I was looking for some old, um, I was going through my old filing cabinet and I found the original, uh, the absolute original first leaflet that we did for my mum's campaign, the Free Zero Shah campaign in 1995, 96. Um, and, and so that campaign, that kind of gave me the idea of what it was, what, to put a, a, some context into my experiences. Um, I then had a really successful career parallel to that. I started off as a carer, I worked my way up as an advocate, from an advocate to influencing policy, to becoming a commissioner. So I commissioned the public sector across Bradford uh, in terms of the voluntary and community sectors. So I started off in the voluntary sector after I'd done my caring. Um, and then I chaired the largest black minority ethnic um, uh, BAME mental health services in, Brad in Bradford, sharing voices outside of London. So I had, uh, so I was very, very involved with the um, with the DRE work, with the focused implementation site in Bradford, uh, following the Rocky Bennett inquiry. I was also, you know, I, I also kind of like grew up in the area, if you like, of the Stephen Lawrence stuff in the background, the Zaid Mubarak inquiry, the Ricky Rio, and because you were in a campaign, you got to know about other campaigns, and you met people and you worked together and showed that solidarity and support. So I think that's where my race, activism and gender came from. Moving forward, I then went on to, in, uh, more recently in 2008, I was very, very blessed and privileged as part of my NHS senior role, I was put forward for the, as part of the national, um, national alumni for future leaders in the NHS. And during that, during that um, programme of leadership development, I kind of like realized how lucky I was in terms of my experiences. I'd used, I was very, very lucky in terms of I'd used my experiences to, to, to you know, I'd used my anger and channeled it into making changing, dif making differences for people. And that was really helpful. I didn't recognize it at the time. And after I went through that, I fell in love with the idea of leadership. And I fell in, because I'm, I'm very passionate about people have their own solutions. Communities have their own solutions. Um, we have a very medical model of med mental health. We have a very medical model or a, or a model that fits the political narrative for homelessness, for example. So when we talk about rough sleepers, we don't see it as a we see it as a homeless issue, as opposed to a societal issue. And actually, we each as communities we have our own solutions. I'm really, really firm believer in that. So with that kind of mindset, um, I, I started. To, I didn't toy with politics, but I did support George Galloway. I first voted for him and I remember being on my interview for the Labour Party candidacy and they was like you voted for George Galloway I was like yeah I voted for George Galloway and the reason I voted for him is in Bradford what we had was a real issue of politics and the, the po politics of Bradford patriarchal politics brotherly politics set up by men for the purpose of men for the sake of men and my daughter is just going to walk through the door and I'm going to let her in through the back and so we had uh, so the, the whole George Galloway conversation started there and then when he made the comments about rape and Assange then at that point I, I, um, I, I aired my views on that I was very vocal in Bradford always have been very vocal in Bradford and we uh, and then when when the election came up for 2015 and that when, when the election came from 2015, in 2014, it was the Birmingham MPs who came to Bradford and said, you know, what's wrong with Bradford? And I said, it's racism. And he said, and he looked at me as if to say horrified, saying you're using the race card. And I just turned around and I said, well, actually, when you've got so much wrong with the city and you've given power to the men, 
and nobody's prepared to question those men, and you're not prepared to challenge those cultural, uh, those, some of those culturally specific issues, then I'm afraid that's racism. If you deal with an issue as an issue itself, but you, uh, but, uh, you deal with anything, that's, that's straight. But when, you do, when you're not dealing with an issue because of the cultural sensitivities, then you're looking at the issue of race, not to me as racism. So it's reverse racism. And he said to me, why don't you come into politics? And I was like, don't be daft, it's a man's world and it's the dirtiest place to be. And he said to me, he said, well, if you're not gonna get in it, who's gonna clean it up? And that was the gauntlet thrown down from, for me. 11 months and six days later, I was elected as the Bradford West MP which brings me on to my lovely election campaign. Uh, so I took on George Galloway. I was very keen to take on George Galloway. And I remember the first ever hustings was like, who's gonna, who's gonna throw the first punch? And I threw the first punch, simply because I'm feisty. I'm, you know, I'm not gonna be, I will not let a man on my narrative and I will not, it's not my, it's not my way of being. It's not my, it's not my psyche. And I fought too hard to let a, a man own my narrative. It's just not, you know, yeah, as women, I think, we've, I think we need to be much, much more stronger and confident about owning who we are, what we bring to the table on our terms and nobody else's terms. Uh, and I think that was really, really important for me. I had a horrendous gutter political campaign, which was very much covered in the media. You know, the, the, the question of, uh, so, so Muslim Women's Network UK supported me, other women's organisations supported me. Um, and then we had the, um, when my nikah nama was pulled out. So in Pakistan, I had a, um, a nikah when I was 15. I had a second nikah when I was 16 to kind of, for the legal purposes, it's quite normal. It, there's nothing untowards about it. But he had the nikah nama for my, they, they trenched through this kind of campaign and legal stuff to find something on me. Uh, and this um, nikah nama, the marriage certificate, the Muslim marriage certificate, he pulled out the one from when I was 16. So somehow, because my mum was there and because I was 16, it wasn't a forced marriage. Mm -hmm. And that was really, really dangerous narrative to set. Um, so that was challenged. I beat George Galloway. He had a 10 and a half thousand majority. I took that 10 and a half thousand to 11 and a half thousand this way. I then doubled it um, on my second election and that was uh, Salma Yacoub. And uh, I think if you if you want, I'm not going to go into that detail apart from two things I'll say on that one. That was worse than the Galloway campaign. And I think for me, as a Muslim woman, it was worse from the Galloway campaign because it was another Muslim woman who used her hijab to hijab shame me, to slut shame me. I literally was on, and, and it's on my Twitter, it's all in public. Uh, it's, it's all there in the public domain. And there are videos, this is not just me saying it, there are videos where, uh, where a man just stood up and said, when we buy a dog, we check its head, we buy, we check its pedigree. Uh, referring to me being raised in a single parent family, being a single parent, not being educated, not being used to university, not coming from a political class and not coming from a middle class. You know, I'm, I, yes, I'm in a, in a, very, in a profession which, which is very privileged and for a huge honor, but I'm really, really grassroots and I come from, from, from Bradford and, and I'm made in Bradford. And, uh, Alhamdulillah, Bradford has given me great, great, great opportunities, as have my constituents. Um, but ultimately, I'm from that background. And that was used against me, uh, the fact that I've been on benefits, the fact that I've experienced homelessness, all of that. So it was horrible, horrible um, uh, experience. And it drove, you know, I, I felt suicidal on two points, two occasions in that, in that um, election. And then more recently, when the West Midland mayoral election was coming up again, um, and that was brought up and that was really, really painful. That was horrendously painful, again, to relive all of that. Uh, but again, as a Muslim, where do I, where, do, where am I now? I'm now in, on Keith Starmer's front bench. I was serving on Jeremy Corbyn's front bench. I spent a couple of years on the Home Affairs Select Committee. I had, um, I had an incident in 2016, which, um, which started, or, or as the BBC would put, started the kind of whole anti-Semitism conversation in the Labour Party. Um, again, that keeps coming up, that keeps coming up because we didn't get to grips with it. So politically, I've been through in five, first five years. Now I think it's a bit stable, but now we've got COVID. So in politically speaking, the first five years, we had the whole conversation of uh, the hard left uh, uh, in, in the Labour Party, which had never happened before. We had Brexit, we had free elections. 
So the first five years for any MP who joined in 50, in 2015, mm -hmm. we've not really, I don't think we've been able to allow to be the MPs that we'd have expected to be, or, you know, doing the, the work that we, we would, we would, what is, what we used to be normal in political terms. So everything is kind of like change, change and change. And then we had 2019, and now we're at a stage where we've got COVID. And COVID is another thing that has really, really thrown up massive issues. Again, as a, as a politically back MP, <coughs> we have the issues of, um, so, so we have a, a disproportionate way it impacts on our communities. Right, so Bradford, I'm really, really pleased to say we really, really were ahead of the curve in terms of our messaging, in terms of our communities. So that came from the community. And again, it just signifies that key people have their own solutions. Um, and I know they have their own solutions because Bradford's communication skills and our medics from our mosques and everything went out and got the message out. So we didn't get the deaths that we were expecting. Our hospital is, uh, I'm really, really lucky to have the kind of team at the hospital because they were really, really big on uh, R&D, uh, research and development. And our team has been ahead of the game in terms of not putting people so we're an exemplar in terms of our hospital. So we're not putting people on uh, straight away on um, the ventilators. So we've saved a lot more lives. We had much less deaths. Um, and then we were back in the news again last week because we're potentially going to go into lockdown with. So it's about, some of it is about, some of it is about firefighting, which is natural for any political person because in politics an hour is a long time. You know, by the time PMQs has finished, there might have been another narrative developing by the time we come off this call. Uh, you know, politics really, really does shift. And then it, during COVID, we had the BAME, the, uh, the NHS review and everything else. And then we had BLM and George Floyd and all the rest of the stuff that's happened with that. Um, now that is concerning. And, I, and the reason I'm looking there is that it's outside my window. I can see this little boy and I was just worried he was going to run to the road. Anyway, he's not, he's gone back. Um, so I don't think my neighbour's got the gate closed. Anyway, so we have, um, so, so where I'm at now, and the challenges for me now, is I'm very vocal, I'm very uh, vocal around Islamophobia in particular. I'm a member of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on British Muslims. Um, yes, it is hard, I'm one of the most abused MPs, only second to Diane Abbott is my understanding, but in terms of toxicity of tweets, I get a lot more than Diane Abbott, uh, according to the last piece of research that I read. So it's really, really, you know, I put out a tweet, there's, and I only kind of like, I'm still, so, some of it is, you're still kind of figuring it out. So yes, I made a mistake on Twitter, which lasted eight minutes, but as a result of that one tweet, that was a genuine accidental retweet, but on its own, it looks horrendous. Because of that tweet, I've had people literally making death threats to me and my family, and, and I've had somebody go to prison for it, right? So it's like, you get to that place where, you know, like, so, so, and I only contextualise this when I was see, speaking to somebody last week was, you, and somebody asked me the question, why, you know, what does it do to you? And I said, well, it's like being, I suppose, when I was in my first marriage at 15, or the, the bit I forgot was that he used his fist to speak as well, and, I, and he was horrendous. Um, but there's, you know, when you, when, when, if, if you've ever been in an unfortunate position of having domestic violence and experiencing domestic violence, what happens is, you're made, if you've, you've made a genuine mistake and you've made, you know, I, I don't know, you've not really got the eggs right for being hard boiled or soft boiled, right? Just, I'm just hypothetically speaking, and you, you've got somebody who's abusive to you. You've made a mistake because you didn't know. And then you're battered and you feel, you, you get to, you, you're, you're made to feel that it was your fault. And it's okay for somebody to batter you because you made a mistake. And then that, and that, carries on and carries on and you're made to start feeling that actually you were wrong and that actually there is no context to your even if, if there was a context to your mistake and that it was a genuine so for example if i made it, if i make a mistake on eight minutes on twitter i can get death threats and it's not an issue i can get you know i can get right wing videos made about me it's not an issue but if somebody else makes it you know it, 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 when I say it's not an issue, it's a massive issue. It's not an issue for us to respond to, but it's a huge issue in terms of the, the, the mistake is an issue, but me getting abuse is not an issue, right? In comparison, you've got three Tory MPs who retweet a right-wing video 
about the leader of the opposition and it's doctored and and it's like okay we apologize but they, they're not going to get any comeback on that even though they visibly you know deliberately shared that knowing what was in that not knowing whether it was doctored or not but that he said this and and as positions that people in positions of power you should know better to check something and actually write a tweet i'd never written a tweet do you know so if you if you and, and, and if you look at all of that what it tells you is there's a huge imbalance about when you're a muslim woman in politics right now and as the as the blm uh, movement and and the pretty patel letter which i'll finish on the letter isn't about diminishing Pretty's experience of her racism. I absolutely stand in solidarity with anybody experiencing prejudice. The letter is about, here was, and you've got to look at Hansard, here is a letter, which, which here is a woman who's saying, as a black woman, I worry for my three-year-old black son. And then it's like, I understand that because I've experienced racism. No, you don't. You do not understand uh, in any way, shape or form, how it is because I, I cannot feel what you're feeling as a black woman with a three-year-old son. I, I can't, right? It's, it's, I can understand it, but that doesn't mean to say it. And then to follow on with that saying, actually, um, uh, actually, I'm not gonna take lessons from you. I think that was what really, really riled me in terms of the experience. And I'm not expecting somebody, but somebody's at my door. So on that note, I'm going to. That's fine. That's a good. That's a good. Go to your door. That's a good uh, point to break. Um, she will come back. So I didn't interrupt Naz because actually she was touching so many points. Um, and one of the things I definitely want to ask is how do you deal with all of that? You know, how do you remain resilient? What support networks do you have in place? Um, I'll ask for some kindness from the listeners because that's that's not the speaker you want to go after with that story, <laughs> that, that level of inspiration. There's, <laughs> Isa, you should have let me go first. <laughs> no, it's not a comparison. And actually, I was so impressed, and this is genuine. I was so impressed by your bio yesterday, and I think it's really important. You know, part of the reason for inviting you to speak today is. I mean, Naz has raised a lot of challenges and I think part of what I want to know is how do you overcome those challenges, you know, um, or how do you deal with it? Maybe you don't overcome them and they go away, but how do you cope with them on a daily basis almost? Um, because the online abuse, I mean, besides having abuse, you know, not, you know, face to face and heckling, all of those things, but online abuse is like on a whole other level. So how do you deal with just the sheer volume of that kind of stuff, I think is really important and is a consideration. It came up in our conversation last week around um, on, you know, local councillors and how they deal with it. But I think when you're, um, when you're an MP, I think you get it, you know, at a whole other level. Okay, so I'm hoping people are back and keep your questions coming in and we'll come to them in 10 minutes. But Resham, I'm going to hand over to you and just thank you again for joining us. Um, and I'm really glad you could have made it. Well, thank you so much. Um, I, I feel so privileged to be here. Um, so I won't, um, obviously, I've, I've got 10 minutes. So I just want to give you a, a very different angle than Naz did just to try and cover the different breadth. So I know, uh, Faisi, you mentioned that, that they'll, people will hear from the Parliament project, I think you said next week on how to act yeah. as a, a candidate. Uh, so I won't focus on that too much. But what I will say is, um, I, you know, I went to university, I read economics, I did a lot of policy there. And I love policy, but I never thought I would like politics, because kind of as Naz said um, I don't know partly if it's the BME heritage and what politics are like in our home countries or if it's just what the Daily Mail and other papers say about MPs but my view of politicians was pretty low uh, so I never actually thought that was something I wanted to do and quite by accident I fell into politics so at 23 um, I was looking for a job and I found out about an organization called the Conservative Friends of International Development and I really wanted to work on development policy um, my parents were both born in Africa, so Kenya and Sudan. My, my heritage, my grandparents were all from India, so I felt really passionate about development policy. 
And I got this job, it was one day a week. And the, the founder was a baroness uh, called Anne Jenkin. And she said, why don't you work for me one day a week and work for an organization called Women to Win one day a week. And Women to Win is a conservative party organization. It's been around 15 years now to try and get uh, more women elected to parliament. And every, uh, every one of the main parties has their version of it. You know, there's the Labour Women's Network, the Lib Dems have the same. Um, so I started doing that in 2012 and started working in parliament. And I have to say, if you haven't visited, contact your MP when it's safe to and do, because there is this incredible energy, this real buzz. It's such an inspirational place, I find anyway, um, because you, you just feel like there are people who, contrary to the way the press sells it, these people who are spending, you know, 100 hours a week working to try and change the country. And whilst we might not agree on the best way to do that, I think 99.9% .9 of people I've met in politics, their, their reasons for being that are genuine. They want to make a difference. They want to change their community, their country for the better. And it was only when I was there that I realized that actually if you work for an MP or if you are an MP, and there are lots of ways of getting involved, you don't have to do you don't have to become an MP, um, but I hope you do because the work you can do and the things you can change are absolutely incredible. So uh, someone contacted us, my MP was out at the office, the MP I worked for at the time, and it was this man and he was really upset on the phone. He says, I have a three month old baby who's really, really ill and I have to bring this baby to Great Ormond Street every month and we have a four year old so we can't, one of us has to stay back with the four year old and he's really upset as he's telling me that he can no longer afford the transport to get his kid to Great Ormond Street plus the hospital because he doesn't know how long he'll be, the, the hotel, he doesn't know how long he'll be there every month. And he's crying as he tells me that he thinks his baby son will die. Um, so I spent a week, uh, you know, using the magic letters MP, every person I, I spoke to, every trust, every, you know, all of the things I could do. And at the end of the week, I could call him back and say, I've managed to get you free NHS transport till your son is three at which point he can have the heart surgery he needs and this guy cried and he said you've saved my child's life and I'd only done what my job was but that day that feeling that made me realize that as an MP or as an MP staff member you can literally change someone's life in a way that I don't think any other job gives you quite that same platform or ability to be able to do so Yes, of course, there's the big policy stuff where you're changing laws and you're changing things for the entire country. But if you're passionate about helping individual people, you can do that in a way that you, you just can't do in any other way. Um, but as Naz has said, it is, it is a difficult path. And I've seen someone talking about, uh, would you do this as a young woman? I stood for parliament for the first time in 2015. Um, I was 20 when I was selected and I stood in South London so Dulwich and West Norwood and people hear Dulwich and they think oh that must be nice as a conservative but actually um, it's, a, it's a very safe Labour seat and let me tell you that as soon as you wear a rosette whichever colour you're actually um, you, people stop thinking of you as a person they forget you have feelings they forget that you you, you know words hurt and uh, sorry, excuse my language, um, but I got called a cunt on a weekly basis, and not by not not just once, you know, not by people who looked like they would abuse you. I got called that by people in every situation, every, every circumstance. I had people spit at me, and people throw beer cans at me, um, sometimes full, sometimes empty, and it was this totally shocking thing. I was like, but I'm standing on your doorstep unpaid for free at my own expense trying to do something good and I don't say this because you know I want anyone to feel sorry for me I want to tell you because I think it's important to know the bad and the ugly but it's important to know that the good is so so much better it absolutely outweighs all of that but I don't want to pretend that there isn't the bad with it and I got really lucky I didn't actually and again, I think it's really sad that I say this when I say I'm really lucky I've never had a death threat or a rape threat on social media because my view is it's inevitable that I will one day. I'm just lucky to have escaped the trolls till now. Um, but there is also so much support out there. Um, you know, people paint politics as such a adversarial 
kind of sector and in some ways it is but I've made the best friends I can imagine through politics and I've had mentors and I know people sometimes worry about um, sexism or racism but actually I feel that I've been hugely accepted uh, for who I am regardless of how I look or my background or my age I've had mentors um, at every level, you know, it, it's this weird situation where I, I feel like I have MPs chasing me to say, how can we help? What can we do? Um, call me anytime you want to, text me anytime you want to. And you just think it's a really weird situation where I would, I would never have thought that was the case before I entered politics. I mean, I lost the 2017 election uh, when I fought in a target seat in Coventry and a week later I had a handwritten letter from Sajid Javid to say, just wanted you to know I thought you did really well, blah, 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 blah. And you're thinking, okay, so this is surreal. The Chancellor has written to me. Um, you know, and actually what I want to tell you is there is so much support out there, uh, regardless of what party you choose, uh, you know, I'm sure Naz, um, you know, will, will support you, I'll support you Women to Win, the Labour Women's Network, whichever party you join, there is so much support out there. Um, and the good parts are that when you're a political candidate, even if you don't win, uh, and sadly I say that as a two-time loser, um, but uh, third time's to come, so third time lucky. Um, but even if you don't win, you actually have this incredible platform for the duration of your uh, campaign, where you get to go on to TV, you get to go on the radio, you get to do hustings, which are terrifying, but also exhilarating because you're speaking to 200, 300 people. It's like democracy at its finest, that you actually speak to your potential elected representatives. So if you care about your local schools or hospitals, if you care about the transport or the infrastructure, you actually have a real platform to speak about that and to get attention on the issues that you care about in a way that you never ever would before. And I know for a lot of us, you know, minority backgrounds and female in a, especially if you're not in the Labour Party, in a very still male dominated arena. Um, obviously the Labour Party is the most balanced by gender. Um, but if you, you know, if, if, even if you're worried about that, actually what you find is that you can be the person that creates that change. So I was knocking on doors in 2015 and obviously you give leaflets out. So every household had leaflets with pictures of me and pictures of the other opponents too but I like to think mine was top of the pile and um, I knocked on a door and this little girl opened the door her brother comes running over and I explained why I was there and the boy said I'm going to be an MP and his obviously they'd had the brilliant Tessa Jowell as the MP before that so a female MP was not surprised to them and the little girl turns to the boy and she goes don't be stupid only girls can be MPs and I thought how brilliant is that that actually it doesn't take very much I didn't have to win I mean I was competing against a, a woman who Helen Hayes so either way they ended up with a woman but what was great was that actually you only have to be present for a short amount of time to literally change the way that society sees this job and if you don't think you're ready to be an MP there are so many ways to get involved uh, I've been um, an area chairman so I've been the chairman for North West London so Ealing, Brent, Harrow and Hillingdon uh, I'm on the I've been I stopped this year but I was on the board for London for the Conservative Party there are lots of different organizations you can be a counsellor you can be a campaigner so I would say that if you think you're not quite ready uh, to be the next Naz Shah or, um, you know, to, to start on that journey, actually there are so many different ways that you can get on that path. Um, and what I would also say that's important to remember is that generally elections happen every five years. Of course, the last few years have been kind of crazy, um, but generally it takes every five years and generally um, you're not going to win your first time round. So if you think about it, actually you're looking at a five, 10 or 15 year journey. Um, I stood the first time in 2015 and even if I win next time, that will be nine years. So don't worry about being too young. Don't hold yourself back. We as women are so good at finding reasons not to do it. I'm too young, I'm too old, my kids, you know, my husband, my, my wife, whatever. But, you know, get out of your own way because we need you. And, and actually I really liked that 
um, someone said that to Naz, that no one's going to do it if you don't do it. So if you want more great people in Parliament and you think you would do the job with passion and commitment, then you owe it to yourself, you owe it to society and you owe it to your country to do it. So we will support you every step of the way, but it's a great, it's a great job and it's a great path to the job even before you get there. Wow. Thanks so much. That's amazing. Okay. So many questions that I have, but I'm not going to use my privilege as chair to dominate this discussion. So let's look through the chat and try and get through. And Naz, are you back with us? I'm assuming you are. I, am. I heard you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Compassion in some areas of politics is missing. What are you doing to change this? So that's to the speakers. Okay. If I, if I can just say thank you very much for that, Rish. And I'm sure I speak on behalf of everybody. That was really, really inspiring. And you're absolutely right. You know, the, the, the things that we, we can change people's lives. And it is an absolute honour to be able to do that. It really is. And I wish you well, third time lucky. <laughs> we need more women like you in Parliament. Um, and it is absolutely right that we, we need more women across the board uh, to change. So, so, the last, so, so I'll come on to the compassion uh, question. What we're trying to do is extend our compassion. So you can only lead by example. Um, and by leading by example, it's about, you've got to find a balance between holding people to account and being compassionate to them. Um, so recently, I had um, a conservative, uh, it happened to be a Tory um, woman who had told me to go back to Pakistan. And, you know, she then went and apologised, but this is a woman who's got huge form. So I, as much as I really, really dug down in my in the depths of my heart to find compassion, it's, um, I, I struggled because there was such a big history about it. If somebody makes a mistake, you make a, a, a you know, you make a single mistake, you recognise it, you apologise. That's one thing. When you've got a history of years and years of that kind of issue, then there's, it needs more than compassion, it needs action. Right, so, so I'm very grateful to the compassion that the Jewish community afforded to me. Um, when I was, when my actions were anti-Semitic, they recognized when I went to the synagogue that I myself was not anti-Semitic, but what I had done was anti-Semitic. And, and for that I got, because I, it was open and, and I got the compassion and I was open and honest, we, we were able to move from that position to be in a position where I can still talk about my passion, which are issues around the oppression of the Palestinians, but equally not hold entire communities responsible for it and not go into that kind of uh, the, the anti-Semitism and, and trying to, you know, vilify a, a people for it and a race for it. So I think that's really, really important. And that was through compassion. I think compassion is very, very important in the position of leadership, but it is very, very, um, in, in politics, it's hard. It's really, really hard because you've got to balance it with holding. So, Whilst so now, can you, can I, sorry Naz, can I interrupt and ask you, you know, you've been through a lot and how, what gives you the strength and how do you build your resilience? Because that's really a theme that, you know, comes through. Uh, there's two things that I'm seeing on the chat actually. One is the lack of confidence um, that, well, we as women, I think have. Um, but, you know, so how do you, how do you, how do you deal with that at a community level, but then also in the face of such opposition, whether on a personal level or from your colleagues, from society, more largely through the online kind of experience, what gets you through? And is there specific levels of support that either you give yourself or you have had along the way? So whether that's mentoring, support networks, Okay, so, so on, a, on a personal level, the reason where my resilience came from to, be, to begin with was when my mum went to prison, I, I, I saw that, I interpreted that as my mum tried to protect us and she lost her liberties and she lost her life and she lost her home and she had yeah. all this to protect us. So I owed it to my mum to give her back that honour. And that is, is a very, it's, a, it's like a double-edged sword. So whilst it is something that will oppress women, and make women feel that they belong to, or whatever, like in the Victorian times, you know, you belong to a man because you are a woman. 
there's also vivicide, which is which which was we all do for self validation for self for self uh, for our own selves is we want to achieve and be the best that we can be because that gives us gives us the validation that we can do what we want to do and live our lives. So is this is a very very double edged sword. So initially it was very very much about it. I didn't have a choice. The truth is I didn't have a choice because I had a brother and yeah. sister. I'd lost my home. I had a mum in prison. If I crumbled, I remember first time seeing my mum in prison, it was like leaving a child in a nursery. When they look up at you and say, please don't leave me here, kind of you're abandoning me, do you know? I couldn't let my mum, I couldn't let my mum down. So there was a pressure on me to do it. Mm. That comes at your own expense because if you don't recognise that, then what happens in that adrenaline kind of burns out at some point, which led me to my own mental health issues. So the first yeah. evening I had, you know, I remember the first day that I looked around me, I had no blood relative. I was sleeping on a mattress and, you know, a dog's mattress in a friend's flat. Um, uh, my brother's mate's flat and he wasn't there. My, my sister wasn't there. My mum was in prison. And I remember thinking, I don't want to wake up. And I, and I did try to, you know, I, I, I had suicide attempts in the past. So I had my own mental health demons. So it's not easy to, you know, yeah. yes, there's a million of it. You get back up and you carry on. But the truth is that sometimes it's a very, very dark place. And I, I think... Now, after a 2017 election, that took me where I felt like that, but it wasn't, it didn't take me that place where I, I, I got my support. And my support now, first and foremost, comes from my faith. And my faith, you know, my faith gives me the strength of a Muslim woman. Um, I'm a practicing Muslim. I had the honor of completing my Hajj last year. Um, I, you know, that, I, I get a lot of strength from, from my faith. My mother, my children, I have three children. I have an obligation to them. They didn't ask to be born. It's my choice. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I you know, I, 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 I've got three amazing young people and I've got a, a daughter and two sons. And it's my job to be the role model, not just for my daughter, but more so for my sons. And it, my, my kind of household, I think it's role reversal in terms of discrimination. I've got more expectations for my daughter than I have my sons and I have to be acutely aware of that. But my leadership development gives you a lot of responsibility. So what, so, so from a leadership perspective, we have to be responsible for our own emotional responses. And as long as though we can, no matter how bad the world is out there, even if they've been wrong to you, how do you take responsibility to try and fix it? And that's been my attitude to everything. So if somebody saying something wrong to me, in terms of I was on the chat, there was, you know, do I feel supported? During the Salma stuff, I did, hell, I didn't feel supported by my party. You know, I was ready to, you know, take, take took legal advice against my party because I yeah. felt that it wasn't, you know, it wasn't congruent, you know, and, that, and again, that's in the public domain. But I think, um, and, and the other thing that I get strength from is, is having these kind of conversations, because when I'm talking to other women who are potentially looking at their careers in, and you guys are all potentially looking, going into politics or having that conversation or whatever you, whichever party you may end up in, you know, there, there is, I, I get a great deal from that. Because what it allows me to do is give back something. So somebody, I don't want my daughter, if she wants to be an MP, I don't want her to go through the crap that I went through to get there. Yeah. Right? Absolutely okay for her to have gone to uh, an absolute red brick university, Oxford, Cambridge, anybody to have got there. What I want that person who's there is to get the issues. Yeah. And to get it with equality. That's what I want. And I want that. And diversity and equality are two different things. You know, so diversity, I've got a lot of diversity in Bradford. I'm one of the most diverse cities in the country, right? But guess what? I haven't got equality for the people that I've... Mm. I, I, so actually, one of the other questions, and Reshma, I'll come back to you around what you do in terms of networks and resilience and things. But one of the other questions was around Baradri politics. So, you know, I can know it's, our, it's a, a university challenge topic, right, Naz? Um, yeah. But you know, how do you deal with that, actually? Okay, so, so, so Bradley politics for me is about accepting that there are systems in, in the world that exist that you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You've got to take out of that some of the... So Bradley politics is, yes, we're all about it. We're the Bradley of women on this network called, right? We're, we're a clan of women who have something that is in common. The, the problem with Bradley politics per se, the one that we're talking about in this instance, is that we have got a model of patriarchy which dominates politics for the sake of power, and that power is not, is at the expense of women, it does not progress women, and it is about keeping the power to be a gatekeeper. And that's where it's wrong. 
So do you then, so for me, I've worked with the Brazi to work with them to say, yes, this is wrong, but look, this is what good politics gets you. You don't have to be that kind of, you don't have to endorse that kind of gatekeeping to be able to get progression. If you really, really want, what do you want? You want your kids to get the best, best education. You want to have the best healthcare. You want jobs. You want ec economy. You want, you know, in, in Pakistan, there was a, there was a, back in the days, there was a, um, a campaign slogan. It just said, for those of you who don't understand, I'll translate it. Roti, kapra, or makan. It means food, chapati, kapra, cloth, makan, home. You know, it was so, how do you get your roti? You get it through your econ economic development. You get it through your work, etc. It's really, really basic, simple needs. Human beings, we are not complex, right? We, are, we have innate needs, we need to belong, we need to matter. And if you can get your communities to work with them and empower them to get to that position where they're asking for the things, not because they have to say, not because you, you don't have to know somebody to come and knock on my door as an MP. I'm your MP, it's my bloody job to be responding to you. You know, you don't have to have voted for me to be able to, for me to represent yeah. you. That's where we need to get the community. But God, it's hard work. It is hard work. It's, you know, I feel very isolated, extremely isolated at times. I feel like as if sometimes I'm banging to get my head against a brick wall. But in five years, I've chipped away, chipped away, chipped away, chipped away. And then the big wins help. So when you have the big wins, like I did the amendment on the um, funerals, you know, there isn't a Muslim in Bradford who doesn't know that I secured that and I got that reassurance. So, there's, so that kind of helps. But it's not just the, that affected the Muslim community, it also affected the Jewish community. And from this knowledge, that's the first time we've actually had the Jewish and Muslim communities coming together for legislative change and yeah. actually on the same page. You know, we have now 65 MPs, an increase of 13. And we've, we've got, we've represented what, one in 10? And we've only got 37 then that are women. So I want to see more women. So, so my ask to you guys is, Yes, it, yes there's, there, there's a picture of really, really hard to be in politics, but I tell you something, until you don't take that space, how are you going to clean it up? How are you going to change it for the communities that you serve? You've okay, got to I'm going to, stop, I'm going to stop you there, because I think that's a really good point. Um, and that's why we're doing what we're doing, actually, today. So, Resham, I want some tips from you on how do you deal with the challenges and uh, particularly as a young woman actually how do you deal with it and how do you stay resilient and give me three reasons why you're still doing it you know you haven't uh, we want to see you with those letters after your name <laughs> what, keeps, what keeps you in the game right okay so uh, i'll try and whiz through those quickly so uh the first thing in terms of network and resilience i have to say this is uh in my experience from all the friends i have in politics this is harder on your family and your partner than it is on you because you've made this decision you've made this choice you are fully committed and passionate and um I was, well, I was due to be a bride in two weeks and thank you coronavirus for ruining my wedding. Uh, but my fiance and I've been together for, for nearly seven years. So he's been with me through both elections. Um, when I fought in Coventry, he took a week off work and moved up there, came up every weekend. Um, my twin sister lived in Australia. She took a week of unpaid leave, flew down to London, traveled up to Coventry and campaigned with me. So my parents and my sister, my fiance have campaigned with me every Saturday for the entire duration of both campaigns that I was a candidate. Thank you very much. I hope my wedding's lovely too, um, <laughs> for the comment. Um, but my family have been hugely committed. And what I would say is that even without having children, it's a huge commitment for your entire family. And I'm very aware that uh, should I go on to be elected and God willing have kids, then actually um, that is something that my partner is going to have to be very on board with. So um, a huge part of my network um, is my family. Um, but another big element of it is my friends. And even though I have fantastic friends from school and university and from my life, actually the friends who get you through the politics are your political friends because no one understands quite what it's like campaigning until your legs have turned blue because your jeans have run color from being in the rain for so long no one else quite understands the pressure and the stress and the amazing opportunity of being a political candidate so people think that 
everyone in politics must hate each other but honestly some of my best friends are other candidates and yes at selection time um you go up against each other um i mean i'm going to do a shout out because i know rena rangers in this group rena and i have been friends for eight years we know we're going to compete against each other in seats uh, in the future and actually we still train each other we support each other we give each other's q a work and actually i think you just have to understand that when it comes to that two hours of competition your competitors but for the rest of the time they're your biggest network and support um, in terms of resilience again you just your skin does thicken um, um, I had surgery on my ovary through A&E in the 2015 general election. So I had to leave my fundraiser, um, rush out from Theresa May speaking for me and, and go straight to A&E. And while I was in hospital, I got some emails, mostly very nice. I'd never vote for you, but I hope you're okay. But I did get a couple with things like, you fucking Tory bitch, I hope they let you die. Um, and, and I've got to say, that was probably the low point where I you know your skin's not so thick when you're in hospital um unable to move um and so yes you need resilience but again you have to re remember that there's a handful of nasty people that are counted by the seventy thousand good people in that constituency and that you are the scapegoat they don't in most cases this isn't actually about you um so it's tough but you remember all the good you can do the game playing as, as well um you know and the patriarchy both are tough and I'll keep this really short the game playing i try really hard when i see something to think if this was a member of my own party how would i respond to that and if this was a member of the opposition party how would i respond to that because actually this is about collaboration and improving society together so what is the point in playing politics and playing games um, and if you're worried about the patriarchy you'll change that just by doing it. So when I was selected in 2015, we had a celebration party and a family friend held my hand and I thought this was gonna be like a nice congratulatory, congratulatory moment. And she said, Reshma, I'm so worried. Who's going to want to marry a girl like you? Uh, and I kind of thought, well, I don't think I'm so bad, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, and she said that, and actually it took some senior male politicians speaking at that event to say, this is fantastic, we're so proud of Russia. And some of these people who initially were like, who will marry you? This is for men, this isn't for nice girls. Uh, since then, two, three years later, were coming to me saying, can you talk to my kids? Because I want them to follow in your footsteps. So don't worry about the patriarchy or the glass ceiling um, and you ask for the reasons why i keep doing this i keep doing it because of the man who's now he would be what now five-year-old son is playing happily with a healed heart i do it because in 2013 i worked on a campaign to change the law that tackled youth unemployment that was announced in the autumn statement and when you see your policy being announced by the chancellor you think i did that um, and i do it because i think there is so much I want to give to this country that's given me so much and I want to make it easier for, you know, Naz talked about her daughter, I want to make it easier for my nieces, your children, my children, I want to make it easier for all of us to succeed in our country because we are good for it, they're lucky to have us and we can do so much good. Thank you so much and it's already 20 past so I failed in my job as a chair of this but I didn't want to stop you because I think there was so much um you know in there which is really powerful so i just want to say um a final word um for any of you who've joined today and are thinking actually i need to rethink this i want to get involved um as part of the equal power project we're going to share a link to all the events coming up today the parliament project um is running a session on how to be a local councillor so that will really go through the nitty-gritties of what the process is and sessions coming up the next one that the muslim women's network and the parliament project are running is called exploring your political pathway for Bain women and that's on the 20th of july so it's just a couple of weeks away um so do check out the links we'll definitely email you all afterwards and stay in touch and if you're interested in either standing as an mp or running as a local councillor let us know and we can try and link you in with the many opportunities that are out there um today actually what didn't come up was money and whether that's you know 
you know, when you're campaigning, how that, that, that usually comes up. But if anyone, you know, don't feel like that has to be a restriction for you, get in touch with us um, and we can try and um, refer you to the right places um, to answer those questions and stuff. So thank you. Thank you from the Muslim Women's Network and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye, Naz.